and we are joined today by um, Andrew Snelling and uh, John Whitmore, um, two geologists. And our topic tonight is going to be uh, Noah's Lost World in the most recent issue of Answers Magazine. This is our fifth chat that we've done with authors, an opportunity for our readers who have further questions on topics related to the articles to talk to the actual authors, get their questions answered, because the magazine is all about equipping people. Um, so I encourage each one of you who have joined us to type in your questions right there in the uh, group chat option you have in Google, and we'll be looking at those, and I'll be reading off the questions to both Andrew and uh, John Whitmore. Andrew, uh, could you tell us just a little bit about yourself and your background for the readers, and then I'll ask John to as well. Sure. I have a PhD in geology from the University of Sydney. My background is uh, Originally in mineral exploration for a few years before, uh, just over 30 years ago, I uh, moved into creation ministry. Uh, I've uh, done geological work on many parts of the world and research. My uh, major in interest is uh, rocks like granites and uh, metamorphic rocks. I've uh, been involved in the RAKE project, the Radioisotopes of Age of the Earth project, which is looking at radioactive decaying rocks. Um, interested in the ages of rocks, the claimed uh, radio, radioisotope dating methods, and uh, I'm currently the director of research at Answers in Genesis. And John? Hi, hi, good evening. Um, I've been teaching at Cedarville University in Cedarville, Ohio, for the past uh, 23 years, and my PhD is from Loma Linda University. I specialized in fish taponymy from the Green River Formation while I was there. I've also done some other work on sedimentary rocks like the Coconino Sandstone and some other things and uh, done a lot of thinking on uh, uh, where the flood, post-flood boundary is and post-flood diversification and things like that. So I'm primarily a sedimentologist and paleontologist is where I've done most of my work. Um. Along with our readers, which uh, are of all ages, I think we may even have some geology students that are joining us as well. So the range of people asking the questions and the amount of background they have is pretty diverse. Um, for example, uh, a sedimentologist before a hard rock geologist, <laughs> I never knew the difference until I started working here as well. But they're very significantly different. Absolutely. Okay. So on the topic of Rodinia, um, before we get to some of the questions, I'd like to ask you a couple of historical background questions that have uh, come up. One of them is, um, well, let's start with the idea of a supercontinent to begin with. Your article mentions that it was first developed by a creationist. Can you elaborate just a little bit on where this idea came from? Well, ideas have been around for some time. Uh, I don't think it was uh, sort of plucked out of the air. Uh, Antonio Snyder Pellegrini um, obviously had some background and done some reading because he, he uh, had some geological knowledge so that when he looked at the configuration of the continents today and particularly he looked at the Atlantic Ocean and you know he's credited, even Wikipedia credits him with uh, being the one to first notice the jigsaw puzzle fit between North and South America and Africa and, and uh, Europe, if you take out the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, so he, he uh, put forward the idea in a book which was published in French, unfortunately, it was in French, so the English-speaking scientific community didn't really learn about it until much later. That was 1859, they were more focused in, on Darwin's book, The Origin of Species. And uh, the idea lay dormant for over 50 years before secular geologists in the early 1900s took up the idea and uh, made the same observations. So um, from what we can tell, Antonio Snyder Pellegrini was familiar with the scriptures. Um, he appears he, uh, he looked at the at the way the continents fitted back together again and thought in terms of what the Bible said uh, in Genesis chapter 1 when God created the earth that was covered in water. On the third day of, of the creation week, 
he uh, gathered the waters together into one place and uh, while it doesn't say that the land was one in one place, um, it obviously could be inferred that and so he thought well if the physical evidence looks like that could have been the case, maybe there was a supercontinent and, and certainly the rocks confirm uh, those observations that there, there must have been a supercontinent and it makes sense also with the, the animals, uh, the animals being gathered by God and brought to Noah for the ark meant that they could come from all diverse corners of that supercontinent to get on board, board the ark without any problems with migrating across spe open stretches of water. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that come together that, that confirm that this idea has a reasonable basis in scripture and certainly a reasonable basis from what we can gather from the geologic evidence. Um, well, the first time that I was fully exposed to this was when we worked on the Creation Museum. And uh, at that time, even I had an assumption that Pangaea was the first continent or something like that. Um, now, the museum, as we ended up displaying it, and what the article's about in the magazine is Rodinia. So could you just summarize um, why people like me think, assume it's Pangaea and then why instead the Creation Museum and in our article we would suggest something like Rodinia. Well, Antonio Snyder Pellegrini of course pictured Pangaea being the, that supercontinent. When you take the Atlantic Ocean Basin away and put everything back together again, that's the configuration you get. And um, most people are familiar with that because they're looking at present day plate movement, the whole idea of plate tectonics and continental drift today is taught on the basis of what we observe today with the mid-ocean ridges, the subduction zones with the volcanism, the earthquakes with the San Andreas fault where plates are sliding one past one another. So people are looking at the present and it's easy to project from the present back to that Pangean supercontinent. And that's why everybody is more or less familiar with that. And most people therefore conclude, oh well, um, that must have been the supercontinent that Noah was on. But what they don't realise, which what the, the primary purpose of the article was to point out that on Pangaea was a mountain range, which today we know as the Appalachians. But it also stretched at that time because Europe was connected to North America, it stretched further. And the northern remnant of the Appalachian Mountains today, once the Atlantic Ocean Basin opened up, is over in um, the United Kingdom and in Europe, the Caledonians. And when we look at those mountains, if you drive through the Appalachian Mountains, uh, most people are familiar with some of the road cuts, you actually see sedimentary rocks including coal beds. The coal beds in West Virginia and up in Pennsylvania are all part of the rocks that were folded when the Appalachian Mountains were formed. And they contain fossils that were deposited during the flood. So in other words, the Appalachians are made out of rocks that were deposited early in the flood. So if those mountains were on Pangaea, it means that whatever was before the flood had to be before Pangaea formed. And so we have to look further back, and geologists have been doing that over the last 100 years, trying to figure out earlier phases because there are older rocks and older mountain ranges, and therefore uh, trying to figure out what was beforehand and that's why uh, the article focused, uh, focused on Rodinia as a potential candidate that uh, not, only, not only do secular scientists recognise but also uh, creation scientists, uh, creationist geologists are beginning to recognise this as a viable, a viable concept when we speak about the world before the flood, the world in Noah's day. It doesn't mean we have all the pieces of the puzzle sorted out, 
but it's a it's a reasonable concept that does seem to fit much geologic evidence. And the Bible doesn't preclude the possibility that there was a earlier supercontinent. That in fact Pangaea was just a transitory phase, a temporary reconfiguration during the flood. Like I said, when I worked on the museum, it was my first experience with it. Um, and one reason for it being my first experience is I don't find it written up in much creationist literature. In fact, do either of you know whether this topic has been written up uh, on at all in creationist literature? Yeah, I can't recall. I don't recall anything offhand, Mike. I think this might be uh, one of the some of the first articles that have been written on this. Um, yeah, there was a hit of it when we, uh, when uh, myself and five others were involved in a think tank group that were discussing these issues, uh, and we wrote a paper about catastrophic plate tectonics during the flood. Uh, there was a hint there that uh, the pre-flood world probably matched what we regard as uh, now as Rodinia, and certainly by the time you were working on the museum. One of the members of that uh, think tank, Dr. Kurt Wise, who uh, was an advisor to you at that time, like I was for a, a period of time as well, um, he uh, he helped uh, a depiction in the in the museum, which we've reproduced in the magazine. By the way, we had a chart some some uh, many issues ago, which actually depict that's yeah well that's that's the depiction in the museum, but we had a chart. In fact, the, the chart's over here on my wall. Uh, oh, that's right. And uh, we've, we've reproduced that in a way in the in the magazine in this issue to show uh, to show that sort of um, process during the flood, starting with Rodinia, having plates move around catastrophically, collide to form uh, Pangaea in the process, causing the uplift of the Appalachian Mountains, the production of the Appalachian, and then breaking apart. In the latter part of the flood, to produce the, you know, the Atlantic Ocean basin and the present configuration of continents that we have today, so it was sort of hinted at back <coughs> by uh, creationist geologists back in the mid 1990s. That paper was published in 1994 uh, at the International Conference on Creationism. That would have been the third conference in 1994, and uh, not a lot of work has been done because. Much focus has been more on the flood itself and the rocks making up the flood, of uh, the flood rocks. Also, uh, looking at the radioisotope dating methods. Uh, you know, we've variously been distracted in other areas, but it is time to look back to the earliest rocks because, of course, they also contain radioisotopes and are relevant to this question about the age of the earth, the age of the, the continents, the age of the land. And uh, so uh, we're beginning to look again at what was the world like before the flood, and Rodinia seems to be a reasonable uh, approximation. Well, there, <clears throat> there's several levels of interest in the topic. One of them is if you take any secular geology course, you're going to learn about Rodinia, and so any. Christian that deals with geology, even the freshman level geology, is going to run into uh, reconstructions of the Earth's history. And so it's helpful for that kind of a student um, to, or, or person to know the question. There's also the other question, and that's, that's true for even the youngest readers, the grade school readers. Um, that's an assumption that the Earth today is like it was back then. Um, you mentioned, what, 1859 with Peregrini and, and his idea of one supercontinent? That sounds radical. Um, back then, they were assuming a lot of things were always the same, like including species. I assume they, they, they assumed the continents were always the same back then, too. Yeah, actually, actually, Mike, uh, even when secular geologists picked up the idea in the early 1900s, for 50 years, um, most secular geologists rejected the idea because the geophysicists insisted that the Earth's land masses were stable, they were fixed. There was no known geophysical mechanism that could have moved the continents. And it was only, um, only after the Second World War, uh, as a result of uh, mapping of the ocean floor 
during the during the Second World War for the navies to do their you know, marine warfare, did the geologists start to get information about the ocean floor and uh, the equipment was available to start testing rocks uh, on ocean islands and uh, in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where there are islands sticking up and things like that, that suddenly there was a whole paradigm shift in, in modern geology towards plate, uh, the movement of the continents, um, slow and gradual. Before we, before we move on, John, uh, Mike, though, I'll I, I, I take you up on a point that you made earlier, and I think I'm sure John would agree because I know um, he, when he shares this with his students, too many, too many Christians think that um, you know, we've got to reject wholesale what's out there in the textbooks. Um, we have to be, we have to be uh, very careful not to do that because a lot of these concepts that geologists develop are based on sound observations, measurements of the rocks, careful mapping. There's a lot of data that goes into, for example, putting together these reconstructions of Rodinia. We, we reject the time frame simply because we question the dating methods because there are assumptions with those dating methods. But, I mean, when, when we can match up rock types across the Atlantic Basin, with basalts on one side of, uh, in uh, South America matching basalts in, in uh, Southern Africa, and you can actually chemically analyze those uh, basalts, you can uh, study them under the microscope, you can actually match the outcrops when you put the back together the Atlantic Ocean Basin. I mean, that's, that's hard field observational data. So we have to always be careful when we read the textbooks that we we separate the data and the observations from the interpretations and, and make sure we don't throw the data out. I mean, it, it, the data is there because it's God's world and God has given us his wor word to help us to understand the data of his world. And so um, that's what makes it being a scientist um, exciting. And, and yet as creation scientists, we have the extra dimension. We have someone who was there back in the past who's given us hints about what happened in the past that guide us into putting the pieces of the puzzle back together again. Hey, John, um, you're in regular contact with college students and freshmen. I'm just curious. Uh, I've been at Answers in Genesis for 13 years now, and I've gotten so immersed in it that none of this surprises or shocks me. But I remember back when I first became a Christian in the 80s, that there was a lot of resistance to even the idea that there were plates and that the plates were moving. Um, and so I remember when I first learned about the idea of rapid plate tectonics, that was kind of a surprise to me. What about today? Is I, well, We didn't get any negative feedback so far about the magazine. Like, what are you trying to argue? How can you possibly believe this kind of stuff? Um, so I'm Curious, what's your perspective on that? Is are most Christians even um, uh, open to this idea now, or, or is it still re there, is there still resistance, and why? I, I still I think there is some resistance to uh, some of the rapid uh, plate movement, but that it's from people that um, uh, don't really look at the data carefully. I think when we consider um, the data carefully and look at the data, that uh, you know, we have to come to those uh, kinds of conclusions. Um, and, and the idea isn't so much against rapid plate tectonics uh, by some Christians, it's against plate tectonics altogether. And uh, I think that the, the data that we look at, when you look at rocks that match up, when you look at seafloor uh, topography, when you look at locations of earthquakes uh, and, and things like that, the data clearly points to uh, the, the, the continents have moved and the, the most recent movement of course that that most of us can clearly see was the breakup of uh, Pangaea and uh, so most people uh, you know look back to Pangaea as that supercontinent of course the idea that we're uh, trying to put forth tonight was that Pangaea was a supercontinent but it was a supercontinent about halfway through the flood uh, when everything was underwater and that you know, things moved around quite a bit during the flood, from from a breakup to a collision to breakup again. 
Um, you as uh, viewers, um, we're getting some more questions. I've got some other ones as backups. Let me go ahead and start asking a few of the specific ones that just came up. They are one of them. The first one I want to ask is related, I think, as a follow-up to what Andrew just said. Uh, let me just read it, and if and if either one of you uh, would like to comment. I'm not sure how to view these kinds of discussions. This is historical science. The Bible doesn't specifically address the supercontinent, although it could be inferred. Um, you have taught us to dismiss historical science. So can we accept these scientific theories just because they align with our beliefs? These doctors weren't there, so how viable are their answers? It's confusing. So I, I do hear people say that about historical science. I, it's not in the magazine that I know of, but anyway, I'll let you all comment. Well, I mean, history is based on, and I recorded, we, we have a history of, say, America, and we have documents and eyewitnesses were there that recorded what went on. And so um, when it comes to historical science, in terms of the secular scientists, they're not they're not recognizing that God was there. So they're totally on their own, flying blind, based on what they see in the present, trying to project back into the past. We have an advantage uh, in that we do have a history to the earth uh, and the universe. It's God's word, which is a history book of the earth and of the universe. And so we do know from God's word that there was an event called the flood. Now, God doesn't play tricks with us, and therefore we would logically expect that uh, there would be a consequences to God judging the earth. And uh, we would expect to find, as uh, Ken Ham is apt to say, billions of dead things buried in rock lows laid down by water all over the earth. And that's what we find. So based on what God's word says, we can make... Uh, inferences, we can make uh, predictions about what we would find, and then we can go out and look at the real world, world data, make observations, field measurements. And yes, um, we are doing historical science in that sense, but we're on firmer ground because we're doing it based on God's word, an eyewitness account. It's just like someone who is going to try and investigate the Battle of Gettysburg. He's going to get out the documents from the eyewitnesses. Then he's going to go out to Gettysburg. He's going to find where Seminary Ridge is. He's going to look where where uh, Robert E. Lee had his troops. He's going to try and figure it out. And, 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 and from the eyewitness testimony, plus the lay of the land as it was described, oh, yes, okay, I can see what, yeah, I can see little, I can see the hill over there. Uh, and I can see that hill, yes. And, and so you piece it together. Well, it's the same for a, 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 a geologist who's a creationist. He's got God's word. Yes, it's not as comprehensive, but the rocks don't lie in the sense that they're the product of God's handiwork when he created them and then when he judged the earth. And so they will reflect all the events that the Bible records and therefore we are entitled to go out and piece together that history and understand the world that God has made. I mean, he wants us to worship him with our heart, our soul, our heart, our minds, all our being, and he expects us to be good stewards of the world that he's made, and answering these questions and discovering these issues help us to look after the world better and understand it and understand God's, God's work and his power in the past, which he has confidence that he's still in control today and will be in the future. What would you want to add to that, John? Yeah, I, I think when I do my work as a scientist, uh, I, I always have the scripture in the back of my mind, and, and, and then I go look at the scientific data. And, and my goal is, is to try to make an interpretation of that data that does not conflict with scripture. And uh, in, the case of, uh, in the case of the data that we see in the earth, like the data of the ocean floor, uh, the data of the outline of the continents, uh, the fossil data, uh, the, the rock data that we see that, that shows that things are made underwater and so forth, we want to put together a scientific model um, that, that shows uh, how we can explain that with the flood. And uh, so, uh, you know, I understand the, uh, the, the, the concern by the, the, the questioner has, 
but what we're trying to do in science is, is put together models that, that explain the, the scientific data and that are not contradictory in scripture. And sure, um, our models might change as we get more data. We might be able to further refine a particular model. Uh, we might uh, put one model aside and accept another model if, if we find out uh, some more data and another interpretation that explains that data better. But as we do science, we always want to make sure that our scientific models are consistent with our, with our very best understanding of Scripture. Uh, if I, and I'll add my own. Um, I, my, my personal interest is in history, and it's interesting that Andrew brought up Gettysburg, which is my second favorite battle in, in <laughs> world history. Um, I've probably spent thousands of hours studying the battle. So studying history isn't a wasted human endeavor. In fact, m my love of history and my study of history better informs me about the people, mankind, God made, how they act, how they reflect and distort his glory and image, what God's been doing throughout history. Um, and so historical geology is just another example of humans trying to understand their world. And that I can hardly think of anything other than sin, and even there we have to study sin because we're to be wise as serpents. There's no area of investigation that isn't, a, there, there's not a potential place for us to do that study and, and to reveal new insights into God and how he's worked in the past. When we study the Bible, we're studying history. And when we are inspired by the events the sin, and, and, and challenged by the sins of David and others, I, I find the exact same thing happening with geology. Uh, when I think about the world being a completely different world in Noah's day, that changes um, my perception of the world God made and how he expects it to change, both climate change, the, the, the stability of our earth and what's really permanent and what God loves and why he loves things. If I look at Homo erectus and Neanderthal and then look at myself and my friends, that changes what I think about what it means to be human. And I don't get that just from the Bible. God gave us these other things to where we could see him at work and learn things that we won't learn from the Bible. It doesn't neglect the Bible, and the Bible is the basis for those understanding, but uh, these are other ways God reveals himself. So I don't know for any of your readers if, uh, that are listening in if, if that helps at all. Um, let me give some specifics, um, too. Uh, let's see. Uh, sorry on some of you readers, you're asking some broad questions about C4 dating and how we can trust that and things like that. Well, hopefully we can get to that in the next 10 minutes. Uh, let me a ask a couple of specifics here. One of them says, uh, this is related to what Andrew said a minute ago, what happens to the seafloor during the flood? Is the seafloor completely replaced during the flood? Is there a lot of salt added to the sea during the flood as well? So Absolutely. how do we know something like that? Well, absolutely. In fact, it was um, a prediction was made when um, when this whole idea of catastrophic plate tectonics during the flood was developed as a scientific model, where uh, the ocean, the, the, the pre-flood ocean floor and the pre-flood continents split apart during at the initiation of the flood, and things started to move. The ocean floor, pre-flood ocean floor, being uh, cold and dense, was to sink down into the Earth's mantle. And uh, because that happened catastrophically, very rapidly, and only recently, uh, it was predicted by Dr. John Bowen Gardner, the geophysicist on the team, that um, if it was recent and it was rapid, then the remnants of that cold, dense ocean floor would have gone all the way down through the Earth's mantle, down to the core mantle boundary, where it would still be because of the long period, the, the, the recency of the flood, it would still be uh, heating up and melting and being assimilated and mixed into the mantle. And so he predicted there ought to be evidence of undigested, not completely mixed in, pre-flood ocean floor still there, having sunk down into the mantle during the flood. And a couple of years after he made that prediction, the geophysicists looking at seismic data, you know, where earthquake waves go through the, the inside of the earth and they, they can build up a, a picture, just like uh, they can build up a 3D image of uh, 
you know, with an MRI scanner of, of a person's insides, they can do the insides of the of the earth, and they actually found the remnants of those those uh, slabs, which we would regard as the pre-flood ocean floor. So that was an example of a scientific model proposed by creationists based on God's word, where a prediction was made, and that prediction was was verified. By subsequent observations, and so yes, the pre-flood ocean floor would have sunk completely. In fact, it was that sinking motion that uh, was driving the process. And once that ocean floor sank down, the process would start to to slow down because the new ocean floor coming that was produced as the molten rock came out of the fountains and the, the mid-ocean ridges and made the new ocean floor. It was warm. It was less dense. It needed to needed it rose. It needed to cool and start sinking again. And so uh, that that was that was happening during the flood. Yes. Um, the other part of the question was that more salt would be added to the oceans. That would have been the water coming up from inside the earth would have been salty, and also the erosion. That was going on during the flood. Even today, the salt that goes into the oceans today is primarily via rivers from erosion of the Earth's surface. And so you can imagine all the erosion that was going on during the flood, uh, plus the the salts that were coming out with the hot water with through the the fountains of the Great Deep. And a lot of salt was added to the ocean waters during the flood. Do you have anything else to add, John? Uh, uh, no, not not to that question. Um, I, I see a previous question about um, how do we know, you know, what the pre-flood geography was like, and so on, and and those are difficult uh, questions to answer. We really uh, don't know for sure. We can try our best by uh, matching things up, primarily matching rock types up, and matching. Uh, some of the clues in those rocks up, like some of the paleomagnetic data and, and things like that, especially with what we uh, think are the pre-flood pre rocks. But those are difficult things, and, and our arrangements uh, for Rodinia and stuff like that will probably change a, a little bit as we get uh, more and more data on, uh, on some of these issues. Well, the question also says, uh, do we know anything other than the coastal outlines? So it's like the edges of the jigsaw puzzles, is that the, one of the strongest things we have some confidence in? Yeah, we we maybe have a rough idea of some of the edges, but um, keep in mind they don't fit back together um, often exactly. And we like we don't know the arrangement of Rodinia, for example, as well as we know the arrangement for Pangaea. Um, that's the supercontinent that we know the best uh, the best arrangement for. And as we go further and further back in time, the more uh, speculative that it gets, uh, the more um, uh, the, the more uh, things that are biased uh, towards those interpretations. Uh, so we, we have to be really careful, and we really don't know a lot about the the interior. So we can make some guesses on you know what type of crust it was, like granitic crust uh, usually sits a little bit higher than than basaltic crust, and so on. But Can you define those two words, by the way, granitic versus basaltic? Yeah, a, gr a granitic crust, that's granite. Uh, a lot of people have granite countertops and so on. Uh, that's a, a fairly uh, lightweight rock compared to a, a dark green, iron and magnesium rich uh, silica rock, which is uh, basalt. And uh, that's the type of rock that, that mostly forms the bedrock of the ocean floor. That's a bit heavier. And uh, so, you know, we. We know that there were some pre-flood mountains because uh, Scripture says that all the high mountains were covered, but we really don't know how high they were. You know, were they as high as some of the mountains we have today? Uh, we really don't know. I have a lot of mountains. Go ahead, Andrew. I was going to say uh, one factor that we also take into account is that uh, today we still have ex we have exposed areas of pre-flood rocks. And uh, these are generally the st most stable parts of the continents today. We call them the cratons. Um, they're very, uh, they're not um, earthquake prone. 
They're, um, the rocks are, are metamorphosed or, or granites. Uh, they're crystalline rocks. And uh, so they relate to the pre-flood world. They're remnants from the pre-flood world. That doesn't mean they're in the condition that they were in when they were created or when Noah walked the earth but they are remnants that have been affected by the flood and subsequent events. And uh, these are the pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. These are the, the foundation rocks for the present continent that have been added onto with the flood rocks and covered over with the flood rocks. So, for example, in North America, there's exposures in Wyoming and up into Montana, but primarily up in Canada, uh, in Australia, the, the western half of Australia is the pre-Cambrian or the pre-flood uh, Craton area. Uh, Southern Africa, in the magazine article, we showed those Cratons. And so if they're the, they're the remnants of the pre-flood rocks, they're remnants of the pre-flood world, and being able to match them up is, is what the article's about in terms of putting them back together in a configuration that we call Rodinia. And, uh, one of the means was not only, well, there were several means. There was the matching of the rock types. There was also what we call paleomagnetism. That is where rocks form under heat. When they cool, the magnetic minerals lock in the direction of the Earth's magnetic field at the time they cool. And we can go back and we can actually measure what the direction of the Earth's magnetic field was when that rock formed. And the direction of the magnetic field points to where the north magnetic pole was. And so we look at the magnetism on these different fragments and we then line them up so that the north pole is in the same position for rocks at the same level in the, in the geologic record on those cratons. And that helps to move the pieces back together again. And then another, another interesting uh, piece of the puzzle that we mentioned in the article is the first formed rocks of the flood, we can actually find them. They were the, um, the, the edges of the pre-flood supercontinent. They sort of broke off and collapsed down the continental shelf into the deep ocean water. And uh, we can actually find these unique rock types uh, and trace them uh, around the world from different, uh, the edges of different uh, fragments. And that helps us to put the pieces of the puzzle together as well. So there's a number of ways we can do this. And uh, as uh, John said, um, you know, as the Bible says, we look, we're looking through a dark glass. And so some of the details are sketchy. But we have enough pieces of the puzzle to give us confidence that we've, we're, we've got something there that is a reasonable approximation to the pre-flood supercontinent. Um, well, can I restate this and see if I'm getting it right? Because I think it is a good question the way they ask. So can we know where the valleys were and, and all those things on the landscape? What I'm see understanding is, just like at Christmas when I do a puzzle with my family, you've got the bottom cardboard and then you've got the, the stuff they slap on top that has the pictures that you're putting together. And what happened in the flood is all the pictures got ripped off <laughs> and redeposited. And all you have is the cardboard at the bottom. And some of that got distorted and sandwiched and all like that. And when you're saying we're reconstructing uh, Rodinia, we're trying to take these kind of messed up little cardboard pieces and see where they might line up. And there's some of the pieces like North America. I'm getting my own feedback. There's some pieces like North America that we have evidence that it never broke up anywhere in the middle as far as tore into two different pieces. And so we know North America was there before the flood in its broad outline. That could have been see, bigger or smaller in terms of land area or whatever, but, but it's somewhat like it was. And we can put some other pieces with it um, because of lining up the paleomagnetism. There are other ones like China that they don't have a clue about. Why don't they have a clue about some of the other pieces? What's missing there? Is it because nothing's exposed from the bottom rocks for us to see? I don't even know. Yeah, it may be a couple reasons. It may be that we have some missing pieces. I, I don't know if you've ever tried to put a puzzle together with missing pieces. 
But I, I tried putting a 200 piece puzzle together with one of my daughters about a month ago, my six year old daughter, and about you know 20 or 30 of the pieces were missing, and it was so hard to put together. And uh, I think you know we face uh, some of the same things when when putting some of the continents back together. Um, and with China, it, it, I think it's probably the case where um, a lot of the science geologic work has only recently been started to come out of China. And okay. I think you know as as time goes on and we get more and more out of China uh, geologically, we'll we'll be able to put some of those other pieces back together. But you know we haven't found all the pieces, and we certainly are. Uh, probably missing a, a fair number of pieces as well. Very good. Um, have some other good questions. I, I guess a couple of them are related to the ocean ridges, um, which is something most of us even see in high school. Um, the questions are related to uh, how are those evidences of continents breaking apart. This one says, what are three evidences consistent with the continents breaking apart fast versus slowly? Are stress marks on the ocean floor one of these? Well, if you want me to reread it, I will. <laughs> yeah. The, evid the evidence on the ocean floor uh, for the breakup is the, is the uh, mid-ocean ridges as the site of where new material is coming up, where the hot water comes up, where the molten material, and it builds. Um, the fact that that it's a rapid process is uh, something that we we interpret based on a number of lines of evidence. And the secular community uses radioisotope dating to show that it was slow and gradual, and they date different rocks. Whereas if you strip away that time assumption, You've got to ask yourself, well, it's all very well, um, it's all very well having the rocks move apart, but you've got to have a mechanism. And the interesting thing is that uh, that the constituents of the mantle, the the uh, the way um, the way the process would have started, implies that you get a, a feedback mechanism. Let me explain. You start pushing the ocean floor towards the continents. The continent where the old, uh, where the pre-flood ocean floor was abutting the continent, is going to break, and it's going to start to fall. Well, when it starts to fall, it's going to cause friction. It's going to get resistance to, to going down, even though it's denser and it's going to sink. It's going to get resistance, but that resistance generates heat, and but heat allows the resistance to be overcome. So the, the, the process goes a bit faster, generates more friction, more heat, which overcomes that friction, so it goes faster. And so you get this feedback loop. You can actually you can actually simulate it in a computer. And that was one of the things that Dr. John Baumgartner did. He actually did a uh, he developed a computer program where he uh, mathematically put in the computer the conditions at different points in the mantle and on the Earth's surface, and then he started the process, and the feedback loop mechanism uh, changed the parameters in each of those areas so that the process, you could show the process went faster and faster and faster. And uh, so um, it, it's, it's more than just observations on the ocean floor. It's actually looking at the mechanism that could have Cause this to happen. There another evidence of rapid movement that you want to add, John? Yeah, I would, I would just say about the mid ocean ridges that, you know, we think they're relatively recent because they hardly have any sediment on them at all. As you uh, go away from the center of the mid ocean ridge to uh, the edges of the continent, the, the sediment pile uh, gets deeper and deeper. And uh, those uh, those ridges uh, we think are, are are very recent because they have very little sediment on them. Well, thanks. That answers another question. Um, well, for anybody that wants to look it up, I think it's a little more complicated question, and it was covered even in that chart Andrew has up on the wall. There's also the uh, I even forget the name of it, where you've got the the magnetic uh, 
switches as it's cooling. Reverses. Yeah. yeah. So what's the term? Just tell people the term to look up and even maybe go to our website. What's the term again? The technical term for that? Magnetic reversals. Okay. So if you look up that term on the website, that would be another one to answer the question. All right. The next question I have um, is uh, a lot of these questions refer to the time frame. You know, we're talking about about 4,500 years ago. One of them here, I, I, it's just relate. How do we settle a time frame? This one is: if geologic processes have only been happening for 6,000 years, why do some scientists say 11,000 years ago were hunter-gatherers? Is there evidence for this? Evidence against? I think it's a broader question about why do we hear other dates of what's happening? Well, let's let's confirm what the biblical picture is first of all. And, and let's remind ourselves that um, the scriptures give us a genealogical framework which is related to Jesus Christ. I mean, Matthew opens his gospel by pointing out that Jesus was related to Abraham and, and traces him back. You go to Luke's gospel and it traces Jesus all the way back to Adam. So, um, so there's a historical framework that all the events of the scriptures uh, are framed around and that's where we get at our age for the earth of about six or 10,000 years depending on how you match up all those details. Back to the flood, you know, four and a half thousand or so years ago. Now that's, that's based on historical records of people that lived and died. The geologists and the scientists generally use other methods that are based on measurements in the present and they make assumptions about the decay rates, for example, of radiocarbon and, and uh, uranium, uh, potassium, and uh, they make assumptions about what the starting conditions were and that what the samples they take are not contaminated by other processes. And so there are all these sorts of issues when it comes to uh, a time framework. Now, from a biblical point of view, when, as, a, as a creationist looking at geology, I do not find anything that conflicts with the biblical time frame. Uh, the fact that we can talk about catastrophic plate tectonics and we find evidence for it enables us to explain the rapid splitting up of continents during the one year of the flood event. Um, and uh, if you're looking at uh, the, the broad picture, uh, you're looking at uh, uh, man coming off the ark, the Tower of Babel, the post-flood ice age, all of those events are, are, are fit in very neatly to the, to the time frame. And we don't have to have any... Um, we don't have to be um, bogged down by having to accept all those those millions of years ages. Take, for example, uh, the idea that the ice age finished 11,000 years ago, 10 to 11,000 years ago. What is that based on? It's based on radiocarbon dating and also on uh, flimsy put it, putting together bits and pieces of evidence on the assumption that process has been slow and gradual in the post flood world, in, in the post ice age world. Um, when in actual fact, if you look at the hard data, for example, of archaeology, there was an explosion of civilization. There was writing, there was monuments, there was a high level of technology right from the start. I mean, why was man in the Stone Age for, for 100,000 years before he decided to put a seed in the ground and grow crops? That's crazy. Man was capable of growing crops right from the start. At uh, Noah planted a vineyard uh, straight after the straight after the flood. So um, it's, a, it's it's how we view history, whether we view it based on what God's word says or we try to put it together ourselves without God being part of the framework. It affects the time frames that we look at for the, all of these events. What? Yeah, there's about five questions on dating techniques, which is radiometric and uh, yeah. radioisotope dating. So if you want to comment on a few of those. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think uh, scientists like Andrew have clearly shown that there are some difficulties with radioactive dating. And 
it's the radioactive dating techniques that, that give us all these very long periods of time. And uh, I, I just go to the Grand Canyon and think about examples there. You uh, take some of the datable rocks in the Grand Canyon and uh, apply different radioactive dating methods to them. And I think one of the easiest things uh, for, the, for the listeners to hear tonight is when you date those rocks with different radioactive dating methods, you'd expect them to produce the same date. wouldn't matter the method, but the different methods yield very different dates for all those rocks and sometimes the the, the range that they yield is, is absolutely astounding and so I think we have good quest, good uh, reason to, to have question of the uh, the radioactive dating techniques. Um, things like carbon-14, we've seen uh, carbon-14 dates in, in coal for example that's supposed to be hundreds of millions of years and it clearly shows uh, that there's some difficulties with the uh, radioactive dating techniques. So I, I think that we need to be be careful in using those. Uh, the radioactive dating provides us data and uh, we need to consider what that data is and what the interpretations of that data are, but we need to be uh, treat that very carefully, I think. Um, okay, well, I have my own questions too, so I'll sometimes I make so like the dating for Ice Age, um, isn't it true that typically things that we date for the Ice Age um, fall within a certain range of time when, for the Ice Age? In other words, we don't find something from 2000 BC by conventional dating in Ice Age deposits or with mammoths or anything like that. So there is a pattern to everything, right? Yeah, most of the Ice Age. Yeah, most of the Ice Age things are dated with radiocarbon, and the difficulty we have is is uh, we haven't really figured out how to calibrate the radiocarbon dates with uh, with the biblical record. And I think if we could figure out how to do that, uh, we'd go a long way in understanding uh, the radiocarbon dates and and some of the post flood events that have happened, like the Ice Age. And you're right, Mike. Uh, there is a there is a broad framework that uh, has been developed uh, even by the secular geologists, and no one expects to find a 2000 BC um, piece of pottery, even if it's been carbon dated at 2000 BC. We don't expect it to find it in in, um, in a glacier as part of a, a glacial deposit. Everybody uh, the, related to the ice age. Everyone everyone knows that there are certain discrete periods of time that, that form a sequence on a timeline, it's just that there's different numbers for the same timeline that we have from the scriptures as opposed to what the secularists have, have suggested. So the Ice Age is a matter of dozens and hundreds of years, not tens and thousands of years. Correct, yes. Okay, um, I think we we, we've got seven minutes left. I think you have addressed all the major questions related with the specific article is about the puzzle pieces. If there's any crying question that you want to answer to as a reader, you can post it real quickly there. Um, I just wanted to kind of read off two or three more other somewhat related questions on the pre-flood world, if that's okay. If you could give us either a short answer or a place to go for more answers. Uh, one of them was, uh, I, I'm not even sure what it means, so I'll just read it. <laughs> the layers with iridium, uh, is that from a meteorite or is it from the material in the earth that came out from the springs of the Great Deep? Uh, the iridium layers that have been found, uh, that's a, a rare metal that has high concentration in meteorites, a lot of meteorites. There's no question that these iridium layers have been related to uh, known meteorite impacts, but this is the, the ones that are known are during the flood. Uh, for example, the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, uh, that was the most famous one where they found a clay layer at the boundary between those two rock, rock layers, the Cretaceous and the tertiary, and uh, it had a high iridium content in it. And they found it in a number of places around the world, and then they uh, found a meteorite impact crater in um, in Mexico, 
and uh, the um, the name escapes me at the moment. Yucatan. Yucatan, that's right. Yeah. And uh, the the Chicxulub crater in Chicxulub, yes. Yeah. And so they could actually relate that that meteorite crater to the formation of that that clay layer. Um, that's the primary one. Now some have claimed that you can also get iridium from volcanic eruptions, and that's true. And some of the some of the uh, extinctions, the so-called uh, mass burials during the during the flood, which the which the secularists call mass extinctions, but we would regard them as mass burials during during the flood, where there's a lot more destruction of life all at once, and it's burial are related to these volcanic eruptions on huge scale, ginormous scale, nothing compared with what we have today, so huge. Um, and Iridium was involved with those as well. So um, there's a lot of discussion in, even among secular geologists. Most consider meteorite impacts and that's fine. We see meteorite craters on the moon, we find them on Venus, we find them on Mercury, we find them on Mars, we find them on the Earth. And so it implies that there was not only the flood going on on the Earth, but the, the, that, that judgment also had its effect in the wider solar system. Other things were going on. God was using meteorites, but pieces broken off from asteroids and the asteroid belt rained down on the Earth to add to the destruction that was going on. And the craters are just a reminder of the magnitude of that of that event, the flood. Well, I think this is actually, this is fair to relate. Iridium's one thing. There's a question about the trackways. Uh, you mentioned in your article on mega sequences uh, in the issue, the other article in North America, and they say we find track rate, uh, trackways crop up all through the fossil record, um, and then uh, the email gives some specifics. If living animals were actively creating tracks while the flood was underway, they would have had to, done so, to have done so many times while new formations were being deposited. Um, if these sediments were laid down in large batches by the flood, how could we explain the existence of such tracks? I, I think the, tra the easiest explanation for the trackways is that uh, we had um, animals uh, like dinosaurs that were probably swimming in the flood waters or got carried along in the flood waters alive. Uh, that we had um, continents that were rising up and down uh, that were underwater and then became exposed again uh, during the flood. And as uh, continents got temporarily exposed with fresh sediments on them, uh, we had animals like dinosaurs. Uh, crawling up on them and making some tracks. I, I think that's the, the most reasonable explanation. I, I would add to that that we would also have had a, a massive tidal fluctuation. I mean, on a global ocean, you're going to have tremendous tidal fluctuations. And so not only is there land moving, but there's also water levels oscillating so that animals that were swept away by the floodwaters, if they're going to try to swim, they're going to try to stay alive as much as possible. The tide drops. There's a temporarily exposed sediment surface. They leave their tracks. And, and then uh, the next wave of sediment from water comes in and they're lifted up and their tracks are buried. By the way, it's, it's an interesting observation that, that fits that model. And that is that in a general sense, the tracks of the critters, the fossilized tracks of critters, are actually found in, in rock layers at lower levels to where we find their body fossils. Now, if that's if those layers were millions of years apart, how can you explain the critters that are now buried having made the tracks that are below? We've got to remember the time frame through the through the flood where these rock layers were being formed is only months, and so animals would survive in the flood waters for a sufficient time to be able to leave their footprints and even days later be overcome, drowned, and buried in layers above those where they left their footprints. We are close to the end of our time. Uh, if we go over two minutes, nobody will complain, I don't think. But I'd like to do, I've looked at the last four or five questions I have. I, 
I think I have time to ask. I'm going to go ahead and ask one question uh, or about two questions. I've got a question. One of them is saying, how much can I rely on what I see of the sediment layers that are nicely organized by descending ages from top to bottom? Is that really neatly laid out, or is it a deceptive way to present the evidence by naturalists? So that, that's, that's one question. How much, when I'm looking at the world, do I trust what I'm seeing in science about the sediment layers? And then on the other side, I've got one from uh, Elizabeth. And she said she had heard that glaciers cut through the original landmass and formed the world as we know it today. Now, that's an idea that you won't find anywhere in conventional science. Um, and I guess, I'm not sure where that one comes from. So you've got the two sides. You've got a conventional story. How much do I trust some of the things they say about sediment of the layers? And then you've got some alternative views on how the world formed. What, what should the average person out there do with these things if they're not a geologist like you? Answer think, it however you want. Yeah, I think we need to, you know, carefully look at the data. Uh, rock layers are data that we see. We can trace rock layers from the Grand Canyon uh, all the way across North America. So that's, uh, th those are data. And we need to try to interpret that data within a, within a biblical model. And so, in general, I think we do see uh, very ordered layers uh, that are laid across the continents. So I don't think that's uh, deceptive at all. Uh, we can we can see that now. The layering, uh, some of the deeper layers are more continuous than some of the layers near the top, and uh, some of that data uh, can tell us uh, tell us some things. Like some of the glacial deposits uh, are not as continuous as some of the deeper uh, marine deposits that we see in the Earth. I'll, let I'll, add to what, I'll add to what John says. You mentioned the Grand Canyon, and I'll be out there in, in less than two weeks' time, and, and we can actually, you can go from the bottom of the Grand Canyon at, at the place where you can see the erosion occurred where the flood began, and you can climb up the, the walls of the canyon, and you can go to the north, climb up ultimately through some 15,000 feet of rock layers, that are a slice through the Earth's history, and so there is a real physical sequence uh, from the beginning of the flood. You can go all the way up, and you can find where the flood ended, and you can see post-flood deposits right up to the present. And as John said, many of those layers in that real physical sequence that you can walk over, you can observe, you can touch, you can sample. Many of those layers can be traced through other parts of North America, some right across North America, and some can even be found on other continents. So, um, it's again, you, you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There is real hard data that can be trusted. It's a question of which interpretation do you trust? Those who start without God's word, or those that rely on God's word and the history that God has given us for the earth in his word. And as John said, the evidence of the glaciers is only in the latter part of the record, at the very top, and, and uh, we still have the glaciers on the Earth's surface today, we still have the ice sheets. Uh, the only hard evidence for any glacial action in, uh, affecting the Earth's surface is related to the remnants that we still see on the Earth's surface today. Okay, well, um, I appreciate the help both of y'all have been and uh, I hope we can do this again we won't try to do them regularly as far as every week but we're a quarterly magazine and geology questions come up uh, just for the readers just as a reminder so far we've done show you the variety of things we hope to do and if you want to let us know through Facebook or even email what you're interested in hearing more about we've done one on the ice age we've done one on the big bang with astronomy we've done one with theology with the serpents what was the serpent in the garden we've done one with uh, biology as far as speciation on the Galapagos Islands and now we did one on geology so we're really trying to bring the experts in creationism to you to answer your questions we, this is still a work in progress we're try it's casual we're trying to do a chats uh, if there's a better format, we're open to experimenting and doing things better next time. We're not able to always answer all your questions, um, but you do have editor at answersmagazine.org. And uh, so if you have further questions, you can always contact us that way as well. We're trying to be very 
open, very uh, accessible, and uh, we want to hear from the readers and, and equip and help our readers. So any last comments from either John or Andrew, and then we'll close this great chat session. That was good to be with everybody tonight. I answer questions, and uh, I just encourage people to read and reread the magazine, <laughs> and uh, you know, try to adjust what we share. We know sometimes it's technical, but we need to give you sufficient technical uh, detail to give robust answers to the questions that we're investigating. That was good to be with everybody tonight, and uh, thank you for uh, joining in with us. And I, I hope that you continue to uh, think and, and pray through these issues. Uh, can continue to uh, just consider the data uh, carefully before you rush to an interpretation. And one last word: if you you have questions, feedback is a better one. Feedback at AnswersMagazine.com. So my my assistant editor just corrected me. So everybody have a blessed evening and a blessed weekend coming up. Thank you very much.